If you turn in your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 9, if you've not already done so. And I know it's listed on your outline, it's on the bulletin, so maybe you've already there. Isaiah chapter 9. Well, I really enjoyed singing the Christmas hymns this morning. How about you? Amen. It's really nice. And as Steve mentioned last week, if we don't start early, like the day after Thanksgiving, singing singing Christmas songs, we'll never get many of them in. And so it's good to start early uh, to celebrate one of the most important holidays, one of the most important days for the Christian. You know, and I don't know about you, but every year about this time, I start getting the urge to experience certain things again. I want to change the pace and pattern of my life. I just reflect on that. Uh, I want to be with family and friends. I want to watch the flames of a fire crackling in the fireplace and the smell, the fragrance of pine or fir tree in the living room, even if it is out of a can. I want to drink hot chocolate or hot apple cider and eat good food and think about good memories and dream about happy times to come. But above all, I want to feel closer to God. I want to feel closer to God. Did you notice, uh, maybe on your bulletin or on your outline, that I have changed the name of our series here in Midstreams? I mean, we've already studied three names of uh, Jesus. And, uh, but I wanted to kind of hone in a little bit more on uh, the Christmas season. And so I've dropped a few of Jesus' names that I had intended uh, as far, part of the original series. And I've added different names. Still names of Jesus. I've changed the series title. Instead of the names of Jesus, we're going with a new series title, Unwrapping the Names of Jesus. Unwrapping the Names of Jesus. The same theme as the past three weeks, just a different name. The names of Jesus in Scripture are are really self-revelation of God in his nature and in his characteristics. That's why it's so important for us to study and to know the names of Jesus because basically we can see God and his characteristics and his, his nature and him revealing himself uh, to us. And you know, uh, I've mentioned Charles Haddon Spurgeon's quote here the last three weeks, and that is that God the Father never gave his son a name which he did not deserve. He never gave his son a name which he did not deserve. I want to help us all through God's word to get a little closer uh, to the hope and the warmth and the, and the security that we all receive uh, by knowing God more. You know, I don't know any better way for that to happen than for us to look uh, piece by piece at the gift that God brought to his earth when he delivered his son from the womb of a woman in a stable in Bethlehem. Imagine with me drawing closer to God, perhaps more than you ever have. Knowing him better uh, will change your life. It can give you clarity, it can give you courage, it can give you understanding, and it can give you hope. And my, how we need hope in our um, world today. Let us know God more as we study just a few of his names, and uh, let us draw closer to him in the process. So if you would please uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to take a look at the, uh, <clears throat> let's go with, um, beginning in, in Isaiah chapter 9, let's go with verse 1, and I think we'll read through verse 7, beginning uh, from the word of our Lord. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. Boy, I like that, don't you? No more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness, and by the way, if you haven't recognized it yet, we're talking about Jesus Christ here, all the way back in the Old Testament, in the writings of Isaiah. And we go on in verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. 
They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. In other words, all the garments that were, were used, we see there in verse 5, for war can be thrown away uh, because they will be no more. Now look with me at verse uh, 6 and following. For, un, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government in peace, there will be no end. There will be no end. You know, this prophecy of the coming of Christ again, was given over 700 years before Jesus' birth by the prophet Isaiah. It tells us that the child that was to be born would, would have some amazing names. According to Isaiah, Jesus would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And over the next four weeks, we will look at each of these four names uh, in detail and we'll probably end maybe around Christmas Eve uh, with Emmanuel. You see, I want to help us all through God's word uh, to get a little closer to uh, that hope and that warmth and that security that we all receive by knowing God more. Now, I don't know any better way for that to happen than for us to look piece by piece at the gift that brought, God brought to earth in his son, uh, Jesus Christ through the woman in the stable of Bethlehem. Uh, let's begin our time with a little prayer. You want to pray with me, please? Uh, Father God, as we begin to prepare our hearts for this Christmas season, we look forward to knowing you more. And as we unwrap together the names of Jesus, we pray, Father, that through your revelation that we would know more about uh, your actions and your characteristics and what all that means to us and what you've done for us in the past and what you're doing for us now and will do even in the future. Father, speak to us through your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine with me drawing closer to God. Uh, perhaps more than you ever have. Uh, set that as a goal uh, for this Christmas season. Knowing him better. Can you imagine how that would change you? Uh, to give you clarity and courage and understanding and hope. You know, I think God couldn't wait to write down the text of Isaiah chapter 9. We all know that God's, that uh, the word is God breathed. This is directly from God. And it was so many years ago, uh, 700, uh, over 700 years before Christ was born. And I think he couldn't wait to just tell people like you and me about how wonderful his son would be to them when he finally came to earth. So instead of just announcing it a day or two beforehand, a God 700 years before Jesus was born, he chose a prophet, a man very near and dear to him, and said, Isaiah, I want you to write down and tell people about it. Here's what my son is going to be like. He's going to be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace to you all. And so many people needed that clarity and that courage and understanding and hope. And so God began announcing the news about his son 700 years before Jesus arrived. How's that for excitement? I mean, I can just imagine that God is excited about revealing this to his people. As early as 700 years ahead of time, God was getting so excited about the dif difference that his son was going to make here on planet Earth that he started telling his friends about it. You know, the book of Isaiah, again, was written about, about 700 B.C., and I'm certain that most of you have heard Handel's Messiah, and a portion of that being, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You know, Handel took that message right out of our text. 
Long before Handel ever wrote the Messiah, uh, in 1741 AD, people who felt like they were in darkness were looking at this description of God's son and saying, wow, I mean, this really helps us. This helps us right now in our difficult times. Today, we look at Christ as our wonderful counselor, uh, just one of over uh, 700 names that we find for Jesus in the scriptures. And let me say right up front that in some translations, these two titles are separated with a comma. In other words, wonderful, comma, counselor. Now, that's in some translators. And some translators believe that each title should be looked at separately. And some translations put both words together, wonderful counselor, uh, to come up with one title. Again, wonderful counselor. And I, either way, it doesn't really change things. I mean, it's important to know that in the original Hebrew, there were no punctuation marks anyway. And I do believe that Jesus is wonderful. I think you all would agree. He is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He is the creator of the universe. His name is above every name. And at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I know that he is wonderful. But for today, I want to examine Jesus as our wonderful counselor. Just to give you your money's worth here, Isaiah didn't write his book in English. He wrote it in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, wonderful counselor is Pele Yohetz. Wonderful counselor. Pele Yohetz. That's Hebrew. Pele means wonderful, just as it is written and translated here. But you know, it goes even beyond that. It's used dozens of times throughout the Old Testament, and it means uh, wonderful in the sense of better than anyone else could be expected to do. Better than anyone else could be expected to do. That's, that's what the literal Hebrew means. Better than anyone else could expect to do. Because it usually describes something so great, only God could do it. And almost all the Bible references to Pele are referring to God. Job uses the word when he says that God, in Job chapter 9, verse 10, performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be uh, counted. That's Job talking about Almighty God. And David says about God in Psalm 86 and 10, you are great and do marvelous deeds, you alone are God. And that word marvelous is translated from the word Pele. So God is wonderful, able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. And, and that word marvelous, he does marvelous things. Yohetz by itself means counselor. But in our day and age, when we think of counselor, we usually picture someone sitting across the room asking us things like, so how do you feel about that? And tell me more about your family growing up. Now, I'm not making fun of counseling. I think counseling is a great thing. The Bible even recommends uh, counseling. Uh, but then we see this counselor sitting in front of us taking notes. But you know, up until about 100 years ago, when, when the modern science of psychology was developed and, and Sigmund Freud went out and got his patients a couch, counseling was a far different trade than it is today. Counselors were not therapists, they were strategists. They gave people counseling advice, how to run a war, or, or win a political campaign, or organize a new business venture. You see, counselors didn't listen to your inner child. They gave advice to a king or other persons of, of importance about the best course to take whatever circumstance that they might be facing. Your heads, to give advice or to guide. And later in the book of Isaiah, we find that the author speaks of Jesus again when he says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him and the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of of the Lord. The Bible places a high premium 
on wise counsel. Wisdom and counsel are important. Now, let's quickly look at two verses that talk about wise counsel. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. I'm putting both of them on the screen. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. And in Psalm 33, 11, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, and the purpose of his heart through all generations. My friends, counseling today is at an all-time high in our society. And a lot of it happens, uh, has to do with COVID. Uh, more people are seeking counsel. Uh, there's a lot of mental health needs uh, during this time. It's on the rise. Uh, things are very confusing for many. And there's certainly nothing wrong, again, with seeking advice and counseling uh, when we have a particular need. And again, the Bible encourages it. However, we must not lose sight of the fact, and I want you to hear this. We must not lose sight of the fact that we as believers have access to most wonderful counselor imaginable, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. What makes him a wonderful counselor? I could list characteristics all morning long, but let me give you just three. Number one, he understands your struggles. Jesus understands your struggles. In Hebrews chapter 4, we find in, in verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our, empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who, who has been tempted in every way just as we are, and yet he did not sin. But he's been tempted in every way uh, just as we are. I mean, you've got to remember he was 100% man, but he was 100% God. Nobody else can do that. <laughs> Nobody else can do that but to Christ. And so, my friends, what I'm saying to you is that Jesus gets it. I mean, he understands. He can relate to you. And sometimes when we are going through a difficult situation and someone says, look, I understand what you're going through, it seems empty at times. Because unless they've been through the same situation, how can they possibly understand our problems? You know, the better response might be, if you want to offer some consoling words, is that, you know, I cannot begin to imagine what you are going through. But I always add that you can put your faith and your trust in our Lord who knows. Because he knows. He knows what you're going through. But Jesus does understand. Now, when you come to him in, in need of counsel, he knows your situation. He knows your heart, and he knows your mind. Jesus, I want you to know, did not have to go through the things that he went through in order to understand. I mean, he's God. He, he knows everything. But you know why he went through it? So that we could look at him and say, he really does understand. As a man... Here on earth, he really does understand. It was for our benefit, not him. He already understood. And so he didn't have to go through it. He knows all. He was tempted in all ways for our benefit so that we could observe and know that he understands. He understands us. You know, because of this fact, verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 4 tells us, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, have you ever been betrayed? Jesus was. Have you ever been wrongly accused? He was. Have people ever gossiped about you? Have you ever suffered physical pain? Have you ever been in physical need? Have you ever felt lonely? Have you ever suffered loss? Have you ever been afraid? Have you ever felt that you have reached the bottom and there is no way up? My friends, Jesus understands. He understands. He knows. He knows our struggles. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, that the Word became flesh and 
dwelt. He lived among us. He was fully human, just like you and me. He knows how mean people can be. He knows how rough life can get. He understands your struggles. And yet he says, come to me. Come to me. And that's what I want to tell you in item number two on your outline, if you're filling in the blanks, is that he cares for you. He cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Jesus doesn't care about uh, your money. He cares about you as a person. He cares about you, your character. He cares about your spiritual growth and emotional uh, welfare. He cares about the pain you suffer. He considers you of value and of worth. I mean, you recall what it says in Matthew chapter 6. It's a portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, he said, look at the birds of the sky. They, they don't sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. But then Jesus goes on to say, aren't you worth so much more than they? Aren't you worth so much more than they? God thinks so. He thinks you have value. He thinks that, that, that you have worth. He thinks that you are totally worth it. And he thinks that so much that he was willing to send his son to die on the cross for you, for each and every one of you sitting in these chairs today. He sent his son to die for you, to rescue you from your pain, from your suffering, to give you new hope, new life, and salvation. God can.